Father, this morning, we praise you. We celebrate who you are and what you've done in our lives. We're not just lifting up our words, but we're giving you our hearts. We're asking that you would speak truth into our lives and that you would change us. Because without you, we have no hope. Without you, we have no life. Without you, Father, there's no reason to go on living. But you have filled us with life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And you've given us far more than 10,000 reasons to praise you. And so this morning, we give ourselves to you. Not just our words, but our whole lives, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we ask that you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 7. If uh, you don't have a Bible or a Bible app uh, with you, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. They're there for you to use, and you'll want page 1098. Uh, if, uh, if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, uh, then take one of these. We want you to have the Word of God, let it speak into your lives, and let it change you. Uh, we're continuing our study on Jesus on generosity, and, and uh, while you're turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, uh, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> Don't you hate those awkward, silent moments? Thanks for breaking the silence, but we can't stand it, can we? When it, when it gets in one of the most awkward times in a large group when nobody's saying anything, and we just, it, it, that, that tension on our souls, and somebody's got to break it and, and make some noise, and, and we do that. And, and uh, I don't know who it was that asked the question, but every service, somebody's done that. And uh, uh, which is perfect, because we really do hate those awkward moments, don't we? And they're not just silences, sometimes they're conversations. You ever had a conversation that's like moving along and suddenly it just like hits a, a, a brick wall and just stops and you're standing there looking at each other and, and you're thinking, this is awkward. I don't know what to say. They're not saying anything. And, and you just really want to go, hey, the conversation's over, bye. But, but that's awkward in itself. Or, or you have those, those awkward situations. Uh, anybody ever have that awkward stuff happen to them? Yeah, okay, good. T take a moment. Tell the person next to you about your uh, most memorable, awkward moment. Okay, ready, set, go. <laughs> now, what's funny is some of you are enjoying this because you, like, got a lot of them to choose from. And some of you just had that awkward moment because you don't know the person you're sitting next to and you looked at them and they looked at you and you're like, I don't know what to say. I don't want to talk to you and the preacher told me I had to, so this is awkward. Um, see, you know, those awkward moments usually are memorable. I had so many of them that it, it, it's hard to distill it down to those most awkward moments, but one of them has to be when, you know, I've asked the question, hey, so when are you due? Yeah. And she said, I'm not pregnant. Yeah, and I've done it more than once. So uh, I've learned now. So you've got to be like out to here and looking at the ceiling when you walk for me to even posit the idea that you might be expecting. Usually I just wait till somebody says it first. And then I go, oh, congratulations. Or, or when in, I was in high school and, you know, I was with a young lady and I said, so do you want to go with me? And she said, Where? Yeah, that was awkward. Um, so I just made something up and got away. But, uh, you know, awkward moments make for, you know, they're, they're embarrassing, they're humiliating, they're memorable, right? Because we remember those really, really awkward moments, don't we? They're like burned on our souls. We try to forget them, we can't. Uh, so it should come as no surprise that Jesus enjoyed awkward moments, he actually did. If you, if you read through the Gospels, you'll find that he took advantage of them because they were teachable moments. And today we're going to be looking at what I think it might have been one of the most awkward moments in Jesus' ministry. So as we read this passage, I want you to imagine being there and think about how awkward this would be. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. It said, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, 
And so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, the story begins with an awkward expression of gratitude. An awkward expression of gratitude. Now, we don't understand the culture that they were dealing with, so let me kind of set the picture for you a little bit. The Pharisee invited Jesus to his house, and and when you were invited people to your house, you didn't actually eat in the living quarters. You had a courtyard around that was, uh, the living quarters were around, and you ate outside because it was probably hot inside. So they ate outside and they reclined. They literally kind of laid down on their elbows on, you know, what we would consider like a chaise lounge or something, you know. They're just kind of laying there sideways, uh, you know, sitting around the table eating, uh, reclined. So Jesus' feet were sticking out at the end, kind of like, you know, everybody else's would have been. And, uh, and, and people could come and look in on the courtyard, which Jesus was there. So you knew there were crowds of people who were hanging out, looking in, you know, just kind of standing and watching, hoping to hear something, which in itself is kind of awkward, but they were used to that kind of stuff. So that wasn't so bad. But then here comes this lady who's a sinner. That's a winner. She has a bad reputation in this town. We don't know if it was because she was a professional sinner or if she was just a woman who got around a lot. But, uh, but she was not the kind of woman that, you know, good moral religious people hang out with. And so she pushes her way through the crowd and, and, and uh, she crosses that line that you're not supposed to cross. You know, that, that line of appropriate distance, <laughs> she blows right by it. And she walks up to Jesus, and she stands there by his feet. Can you imagine how this would be? Because that's awkward. Have you ever had someone just come up to your table at, in a restaurant that wasn't the waiter or waitress and just stand there? No, you haven't. Because if you did, you'd go, what? You know, I'm just standing here till you leave. That's all. Just go ahead and eat. That would be really awkward. But she's standing there and Jesus doesn't say anything. But she's not just standing there. She's, she's got this expensive jar of perfume, this ointment, this alabaster jar. And, and, and this is what people invest their savings in in that day. Uh, because you, it was something that held the investment value. And, and so she had bought this with her earnings, however she earned them, uh, and, and this was expensive. But it wasn't just she was standing there awkwardly with an expensive gift. She was crying. And it must not have just been like a couple of tears running down her cheeks because she wet Jesus' feet with her tears. She was sobbing uncontrollably over his feet, so much so that the tears began to wash his feet of the dirt. And she got down with her hair and started wiping the dirt off of Jesus' feet with her hair. Tell me this isn't weird, okay? You're in a restaurant sometimes. Somebody comes over and like unties your shoes or takes your sandals off and starts crying on your feet, wiping them with your hair. You're going to freak out. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, it's, it's awkward. 
But what's really awkward is that Jesus doesn't say anything. He just lets her do this, and then she opens up this jar of expensive perfume, and she begins to anoint his feet with it, and, and, and just incredible honor to, to pour it out on his feet and to rub this into his feet, and, and, and the, I'm sure the smell of the perfume drowned out the smell of the food. And Simon, the host, is going nuts, Right? He's just going crazy because here this woman has invaded his dinner party and, and, and she's just been awkward and she's doing all this stuff and he knows what kind of woman she is and, and he's muttering to himself. You ever been there? You ever been so frustrated? He's like, I can't believe this. What's going on? I can't believe she's doing this. And, and if, you know, if Simon's at all like me, if there's someone sitting next to him, he can't keep it to himself. I can't keep it to myself. You know, I just got to lean over to the person next to me and go, can you believe it? And I'm sure he's like, can you believe this? This guy calls himself a prophet. He doesn't even know what kind of a woman that's touching him. He, if he was really a prophet, he wouldn't let her do that. He'd tell her to get out because she's unclean. Jesus doesn't say anything to the woman. What an awkward expression of gratitude. Weeping at Jesus' feet, wiping the dirt off with her hair, pouring out this perfume because she loved him. Because she knew he was a person of God, a person of grace. And so in the midst of this crazy and expensive expression of gratitude, Jesus makes an uncomfortable statement of affection. Simon's melting down. He's going nuts. He's, I can't believe that you call yourself a prophet. And Jesus says, uh, Simon, can I tell you something? Sure, teacher. Might as well tell me something because you're not saying anything to the harlot there. He was, uh, there was a guy, he loaned money to people, and one guy owed him 500 denarii, another guy owes him 50. He forgave both their debts. Uh, who loves him more? Well, duh, the guy who got more forgiven. And Jesus said, well, you know, I'm sure he didn't address the sarcasm. He just goes, oh, you know what, you answered correctly. And then he says this, verse 47, Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. I want you to catch this principle. Jesus says the one who's forgiven much loves much. The one who's forgiven little loves little. That's tremendous because it speaks to us. Here's the setting. Simon the Pharisee treated Jesus as an equal. He invited him into his house. He didn't do all the things you're supposed to do with an honored guest. He didn't have a servant wash his feet when he came in. He didn't even put water out for Jesus to wash his own feet. You're supposed to do that for an honored guest. He, he didn't greet him with a kiss, which was normal, weird for us, but normal for them. That would have been a sign of respect. He, he didn't anoint his head with oil, which would be our way of saying, hey, do you want to freshen up? He didn't do any of these things that displayed honor because he saw Jesus as an equal. Simon was asking Jesus to his house because he wanted to check out Jesus and see if he was okay. See if Jesus qualified to be one of us because Simon was a good, moral, righteous, religious guy. He was somebody who felt like um, he didn't need much grace. And then there's the woman. This woman who anointed Jesus treated Jesus with abundant honor. Incredible respect because she was a mess. She was a sinner. She was hopeless. And she knew that grace was the only avenue for her. So what about us? The one who's forgiven much loves much. The one who's forgiven little loves little. How we understand ourselves in relationship to God determines how we live our lives. Let me say this again. How we see ourselves in relationship to God really will determine how you and I live our lives. See, if, if we believe that we are good people, moral, upright, honest, hardworking, and you know what? God's lucky to have us on his team. See, we, we, some of us laugh at that. Can I tell you, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times growing up in the church, I heard people make this statement. And by the way, if I hear it now, I just rebuke it. They'll say something like this. Well, you know, if we led so-and-so to the Lord, it'd really make an impact for the kingdom. They'd really do a great work for God. If we could just get so-and-so to come to church and, and join, then that would really impact the kingdom of God. And they're really saying God would be lucky to have them on his team. Let me just tell you something. That's not how the kingdom of God works. God's not lucky to have anyone on his team. 
See, we're the ones who are blessed to be in his family and he doesn't need any of us. But if you believe that you're a good person and moral and upright and God's fortunate to have you on his team, then you're probably gonna be cold-hearted, arrogant, legalistic, religious person who has no problem passing judgment on others. Has no issue whatsoever pointing out those sinners. On the other hand, if we know that we are sinners destined for hell, hopeless, corrupt, and broken, then we will call out for a Savior and ask for mercy that we don't deserve and we can't earn so that He will forgive us of our sins. And we will be grateful when God declares us, like that woman, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. So how do you see yourself in relationship to God today? Forgiven much, loving much, forgiven little, loving little. Let me ask you two questions to help you apply this to your life. First of all, do you see the depths of your sin? Do you see the depth of your sin? I'm not talking about other people's sin. It's so easy to see other people's sin, isn't it? It's easy to, you know, you read the headlines, you hear about all the horrible things that people do, and you go, that is so sick. How, how could they get to that place? And then you see people around, you go, oh, look at them. Look, they're wasting their life. They're just ruining it. They're throwing their life away. Look at all this stuff. It's horrible. How could they do that? It's easy to see other people's sins. That's what we're talking about. Do you see the depth of your sin? Your sin, not your spouse's sin or your kid's sin, because that's easy to see too, right? Because we point it out all the time, don't we? Can't believe you did that again. What is wrong with you? you? And by the way, if you're good at the marriage thing, you won't do that a lot with your spouse. You won't point it out day after day after day and rub their nose in it. It's not going to help them a whole lot. We're not talking about seeing their sin. Do you see the depth of your sin? Your sin. Because you can't really appreciate forgiveness unless you see your sin. Let me ask you a question. When you read the Bible, does it apply to them or you? See, we want you to read the Bible because when you read the Bible, God's going to speak to you. And, and a lot of people read the Bible and they think, oh man, my buddy needs to hear this. Oh man, my wife needs to get this verse. Hey, I got a verse for you. And we want to be helpful, but when you read the Bible, that's, you know, that's kind of the, the secondary reason as to for you to apply it to other people's lives. When you read the Bible, honestly, God gave it to us as a mirror for our soul. When we open the pages of this book, it speaks to us and our life and our sin and our brokenness and how God can heal us and how God wants to lead us to a place of life and repentance. See, that's why I declare that I am a scum-sucking pig sinner. Because I know that I am. I know my heart. I know my life. I know my sin. It's ever before me. And, and, and I understand that reality. I know that I deserve hell and judgment. And because of what the Bible says, I know that you do too. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. Today, do you see the depth of your sin? Second question, do you celebrate complete forgiveness? Do you celebrate complete forgiveness? Verse 48, and Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Wow, that was easy. Your sins are forgiven. A lot of times in the church, we think that's too easy. We got to make it harder than that, don't we? We got to make you beg for it. We got to make you plead for it. We got to rub your nose in the shame and the guilt a little bit just to make sure that you understand that your sins are being forgiven. So we become Simon the Pharisee. Acting like somehow grace is to be, you know, uh, given out in limited portions. And, and every time I say stuff like this, there are always people who go, yes, but what about how people are going to live after you forgive them? We got to be careful with grace. No, we don't. Jesus wasn't. Jesus just poured it out on this woman. Your sins are forgiven. She had not promised to change her life. 
She had not tried to, to prove that she was sincere. She just came and expressed her gratitude for who Jesus was. And Jesus said, hey, guess what? Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. You're a different person now. And you know what? Jesus forgave her and that's crazy and that's grace. But it's true for us as well. See, I told you, I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner. But I've encountered the grace of God. I know that I'm completely forgiven. And guess what? I don't have to live in the pig pen anymore. Now, I've still got a craving for mud that's in my soul and it will be until the day that I die. But I don't have to live there because Christ has set me free. And so I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner, but I live in grace. All of my sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. So I live in that grace. It is undeserved, unearned forgiveness. And guess what? The Bible says that you do too. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, the savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, personal if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that you have made a commitment in your life to follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then your sins are completely forgiven. Can you celebrate that reality today? Do you understand? Have you grasped the reality of grace? Yes, I know a lot of you are carrying around shame and guilt and sorrow for the things that you've done. And Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter if you have a reputation and other people in the community are judging you. He's saying to you, your sins are are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. It's all wiped clean. It's a fresh start. And you go, yeah, it was a fresh start yesterday and I screwed up today. Guess what? Your sins are still forgiven. That's grace. And so we want you to know this so that, that you can celebrate it, so it'll make you weep or laugh or shout or dance. You see, that's why here at Calvary, we are crazy in love with Jesus. Because we know that we are sinners and that we don't deserve anything but hell. And yet Jesus has promised us heaven through his grace, through his sacrifice on the cross for us. And so we are people who are grateful for his mercy. Do you celebrate complete forgiveness today? I pray that you do. If you really don't understand what we're talking about, please see us after the service. Let us explain this to you because this... This is the good news of the gospel. You and I are forgiven. So, we get to uh, understand that there was an awkward expression of generosity and Jesus makes this awkward statement of, of the one who loves much is forgiven much, the one who loves little is forgiven little. Finally, I want you to see that generosity is a tangible expression of gratitude. Generosity is a tangible expression of gratitude. And some of you right now just went, oh man, you had this beautiful sermon going about forgiveness and now you got to mess it up talking about money. Yeah, uh, sorry. Here's the thing though. This is about the heart. This is all about the heart. And, and, and I, as we talk through this part, if, if you really did recoil inside because we said generosity is a tangible expression of gratitude, uh, Understand the one who's forgiven much loves much and the one who's forgiven little loves little. And I don't want you to ever give anything to God that you don't want to give. Can I, can I just want to preface this whole thing. I don't want you to ever give anything to God that you don't want to give. Because the reality is there's too many people like Simon the Pharisee who are giving because they're supposed to and it makes, gives them that air of moral superiority of other people. And that's not what Jesus is trying to get to. Everything that we talk about here is because you love Jesus, because you understand his grace has bought you from your sins and given you life. He has taken you out of prison and set you free. And so we want you to live a life of gratitude. And see, the woman that, that came to the dinner party uninvited, she expressed her gratitude in this beautiful, crazy way of generosity. Because she wept over the feet of Jesus. She wiped his feet with her hair. You don't get any humbler than that, do you? And then she broke open that expensive gift of perfume and she lavished it on Jesus' feet. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Connection issues. So she did that to express her gratitude to Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Are you thankful for God's grace today? 
Yeah, kind of, sort of. Let's try again. Are you thankful for God's grace today? Yes. All right. Good. So how do we express that gratitude for the grace of God? I want you to think about this. What is a tangible way that you and I can express gratitude toward God? Because we can't show up and anoint Jesus' feet. It'd be cool if we could. But we can't do that. Besides, we'd just be copycats then and got to find our own way of expressing gratitude to Jesus. And I'm going to suggest to you that we can be generous towards God as a way of expressing our gratitude to him. Let me show you what I think that looks like. Um, because we're talking about generosity, a tangible expression of gratitude, and I'm grateful to God that, that uh, I get to be pastor at Calvary, uh, I want to give away $100 just because I want to. Who, who, who wants $100? Ser Wait, I just got a comment on this. There's like 12 hands raised in this room of 300 people. Seriously? So honestly, who wants $100? Oh, okay, lots of hands go up now. Thank you. Because if you don't want $100 that someone's given away, I want to know what's wrong with you. But, oh, Sam, we already talked about that. All right, so let me ask this. Who really needs $100? Who could really use it? All right, if you really need $100, first person up here gets it. Oh, okay, here we go. I'm Chad. Bo. Bo. Okay. Thanks, Bo. Come on, step on up here. You're, you're, so we're on the same level. That would be weird talking down to you. Try not to do that. So, hey, this is just a gift from, uh, from Calvary to you, and there's no strings attached or anything. So, just want you to know that. So, here you go. There's 10, there's 20, there's 30, there's 40. Is this kind of cool? Way cool. This is way cool. <laughs> this is awesome. Because you never got, no one's ever handed you money at church before. So, I always want you to put it in when they pass by, right? 50, 60, 70, 80. You'll probably come again then, won't you? Because it's like your first time at Calvary, oh, yeah. huh? We don't do this every week. I'm just I'm telling, telling you that. Okay. So 90, 100. So uh, you can do with that whatever you want to do with it, okay? Thank you. So, hey, you're welcome. God bless you, all right? Hey, um, <laughs> Bo, can I ask you a favor? Yeah. Can I have $10? Sure. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Hey, why'd you give me $10? Because you asked me. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense to you guys at all? Because I want you to understand that it's all from God. It's all from God. Everything that you have is a gift from God. He's the one who gave it to you. He's the one who blessed you with it. In fact, James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 says this, and, and hear this. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. In other words, don't get the wrong idea in your head. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every good gift, every perfect gift, if you consider it a blessing in your life, God gave that to you. He poured it out on you. I know there's some people because pride speaks up and it says, hey, I worked hard for it and I, I busted my butt and I poured my blood, sweat and tears in it and I, and I have my abilities and I, I made the right choices and I sacrificed. Yes, you did. And who gave you the strength to do that? Who gave you the wisdom to do that? Who gave you the abilities to do that? Who gave you the breath so that you could keep working? Um, God, maybe. It's all from him. He gave it to us. Why? Because he loves us and he blesses us. And he asked us to acknowledge him with our resources. And, and biblically, that's 10%. That's what we call a tithe. Where God said, pretty much bring your tithes into the storehouse. So that I can bless you more. Because you're recognizing that he gave it to us and you're giving it back to him because you're grateful people because you deserve hell and yet you get heaven. You deserve to be a prisoner forever and Jesus set you free and he's blessed you with all this stuff. And he says, hey, if you get that, if you understand this relationship and you understand what I've done for you, can I have $10? Out of a gift given unexpectedly, undeservedly. And like Bo, our natural reaction should be, sure, here you go. 
But it only makes sense to us if we get these two things. If we recognize in our hearts and our lives that God gave everything to us. And if we love much because we understand that we're forgiven much. We understand that we deserve death and Jesus gives us life. Not because of who we are, not because of what we've done, but because he simply said, your sins are forgiven. You're in my family. You have life. You have joy. And it's all yours. And you and I get to choose how we're going to express our gratitude to God. Is it going to well up within us so that we want to give him more because we love much, because we understand the depth of our sin? Or are we going to go, I'm not really all that bad, God, and this is really my money, not yours. Here's the closing question. What does your giving say about your love? What does your generosity tell you about your love relationship with your Savior? Because the one who's forgiven much loves much. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for a love that we don't deserve. Thank you for grace that will not let us go. Thank you for trusting us with life, with resources, with love. And today we confess that sometimes we think we've been forgiven little and we love little. Teach us how to love more. Lead us into that place of gratitude that wells up in our soul and is poured out to you. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.